Um, Simon's research covers a broad range of um, things but includes the impact of physical activity on mental health symptoms and also um, the implementation of exercise as standard care in mental health settings. Simon has um, published prolifically and is involved in a number of projects worldwide. Um, more recently, I was looking at his um, Twitter account, he's, he's been trying to increase exposure to um, exercise and refugees. Today, he's going to cover um, why physical activity is important in mental health. And I'd like to welcome him up on the stage now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Polly, um, for the invitation to be here. I just have to say, I spend a lot of my time at the moment at, at psychiatry conferences, so it's really exciting to be back at a, a sport exercise medicine conference and sort of back aligned with, with my roots and where I started. Um, a little bit of background, I'm actually not a, a medical doctor, I'm an exercise physiologist, which in Australia is, a, is similar to physical therapy, but it looks at exercise as, as part of treatment for mainly chronic disease. Um, so when I started my training, it was really focused around cancer and diabetes and aged care. Um, and in the final year of my undergraduate degree, I got offered a job purely by chance at a, at a private psychiatric hospital. Um, and I thought that sounded interesting and kind of turned up. They handed me a dress alarm, shoved me in the gym and just kind of left me to my own devices. And if I'm perfectly honest about that experience, I was quite um, afraid. I'd never been in a psychiatric hospital. I didn't know what to expect. Um, and so I spent the next couple of weeks kind of just with my hand hovering over this dress alarm, thinking that patients were going to be violent or, or angry. Um, and of course, it was nothing like that. Um, and the reality was that the people that were coming to the gym were people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so we had a lot of veterans, a lot of emergency service workers, and they kept saying the same thing over and over again, which was that exercise was one of the only things keeping them alive and it was such an important part of their recovery. Um, but there was no funding for it in Australia. And, and the thing that frustrated me was given the overwhelming evidence we had around exercise and depression, um, purely because we had nothing around PTSD, we just couldn't get the health funds and the Department of Veteran Affairs to actually fund these services. And that's how I ended up getting involved in, in, in research and, and looking at exercise and, and PTSD. So I'm from Australia, which I'm sure many people have been to, and I normally use this slide in America, but um, it, it doesn't look like this at all. Um, my university is the University of New South Wales um, in Sydney, for anyone that's been there, so it's in a great spot. That's Bondi Beach, which is one of the most famous spots in Sydney. Um, we're about 15 minutes from the beach, 15 minutes from the city, and you can see the campus there. There's no kangaroos, surprisingly, walking around campus, but um, you've got to drive about two hours out of town before you see any of them. So I'm going to start with a, a little bit of a story about PAT, and this is from the, the National Report Card on Mental Health in Australia from 2014. Um, so PAT has a, a psychotic illness, he had schizophrenia, he found himself involved in the, in the mental health system, and within 12 months PAT had gained 96 kilograms. Um, and what's really remarkable about this story is that it's actually quite unremarkable, it's really common. It's what we see, the, the, the impact of, of treatment, of mental health treatment, of antipsychotic medication on the physical health of people living with mental illness. Um, and you can imagine the impact that has on someone's uh, recovery, their chances of recovery, their symptoms, their ability to engage. Um, if you think about typically a young person who's experienced their first episode of, of poor mental health or psychosis, they find themselves you know, in treatment in an inpatient facility um, and within three to six months later they actually Actually don't recognize themselves when they're looking in the mirror um, and the impact that can have on, on also continuing to take their medication and continuing to engage. Um, so one of the big pieces of work that we've done is looking at can we actually stop this from happening? Can we prevent the poor physical health of people living with mental illness or do we just have to accept that, that that's what happens? <clears throat> now, I try not to show too much data here, but this is quite striking. And this is data from Scandinavia looking at the life expectancy of people living with schizophrenia. I'll just talk you through it. We've got the life expectancy of females in the general population and males in the general population. And you can see that life expectancy is nicely tracking up. Um, over here at the bottom, we have the life expectancy of people with psychosis, men and women. And not only can you see there's a gap of around 15 to 20 years, um, but that it's actually getting worse. It's not getting better. And so people living with, with serious mental illness aren't experiencing the same benefits from improvements in things like cardiovascular disease detection and prevention that the rest of the population are. And really this becomes an issue about equality. It, it's not a gap in our knowledge, it's not that we don't know what to do, it's just about applying what we know works in the general population to people living with mental illness. So it's really a, a simple equality argument. So when we talk about why exercise, it's actually very clear. One, we can improve the physical health of people living with mental illness, but two, we can also improve symptoms and, and improve mental health outcomes. 
Now this is Professor Graham Thornacroft from King's College London. He wrote this now famous editorial talking about the disparities in life expectancy and calling it a, a scandal. And basically said that if this was to affect another population within the community, we'd be absolutely outraged and we'd be doing something about it. Um, in Australia, I liken this to the Indigenous community, the Aboriginal Australians, who also face a life expectancy gap of somewhere between 15 and 20 years. Um, in Australia, within the public health dialogue, you'll hear lots about closing the gap. And it refers to Indigenous Australia, but the exact same gap is here within mental health that we're actually not doing much about. And so I think for me, this picture sort of sums up my experience working in psychiatry, especially as an exercise scientist, where you sort of have the psychologist and the psychiatrist up one end dealing with the head and the symptoms, and then at the other end we had the cardiologist, the endocrinologist, the GP, everyone else working on the body and pretending like they're actually not connected, which of course we, we know that they are. And the evidence around this has, has dramatically increased in the past 10 to 15 years. So I'm going to try and sum up all that evidence in, in one slide here. Where I think this work started was looking at treating the physical health issues. Um, and so some of the data here, again, from um, a lot of work that I'll be quoting has been led by Brendan, uh, Brendan Stubbs, who's going to talk later on today. But if we talk about people with mental illness, there's an 80% higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease, an 85% higher risk of death from cardiovascular disease. So this idea of diagnostic overshadowing. People with a mental illness, when they present to emergency departments or GPs, um, often the metabolic issues, the physical health issues are ignored in favour for the, the mental health issues. And again, that reduced life expectancy. So of course we know that exercise can improve this. It's one of the cornerstones of, of diabetes and heart disease treatment and prevention. It's just not being applied. Mental health, we now have this overwhelming body of evidence around the, the benefits of exercise in reducing symptoms of mental illness. And that's regardless of diagnosis. And one of our colleagues, Joe Firth, talks about that your biceps don't care what the DSM says. Your biceps don't care what diagnosis you have. And that's what we see, the transdiagnostic benefits of exercise. Um, and there's a couple of papers that I'll point out, but one is a recent guidance from, that again, led by Brendan, looking at serious mental illness, which I'll, I'll present. One of my PhD students recent, uh, recently published a review, an umbrella review, where we looked at 33 individual systematic reviews and meta-analyses showing the benefits of exercise, again, regardless of diagnosis. That was depression, schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, substance use disorders, um, and the list goes on. Now, I think almost more importantly or more exciting is the idea of prevention, and that's where things are heading at the moment. And so the idea about can we prevent the physical health issues of people living with mental illness? And I know at least in Australia, the idea of smoking, for example, used to be something that mental health workers would use to, to build rapport with patients. They would go out and have a cigarette together. Um, if we look at the food on inpatient units as a, as a horrible tendency for, for low nutrient, um, high calorie foods as well. Um, but this idea of using weight gain as a measure that someone's engaged in treatment, someone's taking their medication, um, really needs to change. And some work that I'm going to present that we've done in, in Sydney, Australia, shows that if you intervene at day one, so from the, the very first day that a young person um, comes into contact with a mental health service, you can actually prevent that weight gain and prevent that deterioration in, in poor physical health from occurring. And even more recently is the idea of can exercise help to prevent episodes of, of poor mental health? And the answer is absolutely yes. And you've probably seen a bit of media coverage around this recently. There's been some, some big papers published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, effectively showing that regardless of where you live, regardless of how old you are, as little as 60 minutes of physical activity per week could reduce incident depression by somewhere between 12 and 17% which from a, if we think about the public health burden of, of depression, this is a huge numbers and huge potential for, for having a population-wide impact. So what is the, the evidence on exercise and depression? This was a, a paper led by, by Brendan and also Felipe Schuch, a colleague in, in Brazil. This is the forest plot, I'm not going to spend too long on this. But effectively what this showed is that we're completely underestimating the effect size and the effect and the impact that exercise can have on depression. Our biggest challenge though is how do we actually get people to do it? And I'm going to touch on that a bit later on. Um, and again, this is the, the guidance that I, I just mentioned on, on serious mental illness led by Brendan, published by the European Psychiatry Association. Again, just like me being here talking about mental health is really exciting about breaking down those, those silos of physical and mental health care. Having a guidance paper on exercise and serious mental illness published in European Psychiatry I think shows where that field is moving as well and the fact that these two worlds are actually coming together, which is exactly what we need. Okay, so a couple of other guidelines. This was recently released by the World Health Organization, again talking about exercise and lifestyle interventions as first-line treatment for everyone in contact with mental health services. And this is regardless of country. So even in low middle income countries, there's a, there's a um, huge interest in the potential role of, of these lifestyle interventions. 
So this is a little bit of that media coverage around this idea that exercise can, can prevent depression. And I want to talk a little bit about the media and because I spend way too much time on social media um, actually looking at comments. Whenever there's a, a paper published or there's com the media talk about this stuff and what we find time and time again, you're going to see a lot of um, clips here, a lot of screenshots with some rude words in them. But effectively what people are saying is, you know, this is great, exercise can help depression but I can't get out of bed. So stop telling me that I just need to exercise. And I think we have to be really important and really careful about the way we actually engage with these people and the message that we're sending. Um, and so this one quite here, I'll just read it out. New study finds people that are able to leave the house can manage to get dressed, manage to eat, find that exercise helps their depression. Now again, what the evidence tells us is the people that are most likely to benefit are those that are least likely to engage and need the most level of support. So if I think about the facilities that I've worked in, particularly inpatient facilities, when I would go to patients' rooms um, and say, right, we're going to do some exercise, and they'd typically say, F off out of my room, we actually need to work with those people and provide the right structures, the right support, and the right environment so that we can actually engage those people and motivate them to get moving. Um, and again, I'll, I'll emphasize that it's not a gap in our, our knowledge. We know how to do it. The science is, is very, very clear. It's just about actually funding these services appropriately and making sure that we have the right resources, um, the right people, and the right systems in place to actually make that happen. Now, similarly, when we report on these things, we've got to be really careful about the images we use. Um, and I've had a lot of arguments with journalists in Australia, but having models running into a new dawn does very little to motivate people that are at home struggling to get out of bed um, in the grips of, of, of serious mental illness. So we've got to be really careful about, again, how we portray that. And this came out just after Donald Trump was elected. And again, I don't use this in the US, but you can see that top comment there. Um, but again, this, other, this idea about a hallmark of depression is unable to get up and go in the first place. So stop telling me this is good and start actually helping me to engage in this. All right, and this, again, this is the last one I'm going to use um, around this idea that we need the right systems in place to help people. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about some work that we did in Sydney, Australia. And this is South East Sydney Local Health District. It's one of the biggest um, health services in Australia. Um, in central Sydney, there's about a catchment area of just under a million people. Um, and this is the Community Mental Health Centre, where when I was doing my PhD, I did a bit of work. Um, and this is one of the meeting rooms we had in that facility there. And I, at the time, teamed up with a neuroscientist, Phil Ward, who was really interested in doing some work looking at hippocampal volume in people with, with early psychosis. There had been some previous work published in people with established schizophrenia, showing that as little as 12 weeks of exercise could increase hippocampal volume by up to 20%. So he was really interested in replicating that. So we managed to get some money to, to buy some exercise bikes, but of course we needed somewhere to put them within the mental health service. And so we sort of looked at this meeting room and said, maybe we can take this meeting room. And of course the mental health clinicians just said, absolutely not, you can't take our meeting room. Where are we going to have our meetings? In this old house, there's another meeting room directly upstairs. And if you look at the calendar, there was never a time that there were two meetings happening simultaneously where they needed both meeting rooms. So luckily we had a psychiatrist who was unbelievably supportive. Um, and despite the district telling us no, that's what that room looks like today. Um, and this is now a, a fully functional embedded part of the mental health service, um, which has really had a, a huge effect on, on not just the patients, but also on the culture of the service itself. Um, and I'll give you an example. If we think about young men, for example, and I'll, I'll choose men, there's often this stigma around accessing mental health services. They may not want to come and talk to the psychologist about their feelings or how they feel or what's going on. They're more than happy to come and lift some weights or come and engage with the gym. And so what this does is it actually off offers an alternative pathway where we can engage these people in more traditional mental health services. Um, if we had really hard to reach people, we would often book them in the time to come to the gym and just let the psychiatrist know, look, they're coming in at, at, at lunchtime. And it just so happened the psychiatrist would be waiting in the corridor just as they came down. They could just have this informal catch up. Have you got enough medication? Have you got your drugs? Everything you need. And that's hugely powerful. And so the impact that this has had on the service has been um, quite remarkable. And this program has now been funded to the tune of just over a million dollars of recurrent funding per year um, and it's expanded to four groups across the entire district. Um, so it's now community mental health, inpatients, outpatients as well. Um, the other impact is that it has on the staff. I'm going to talk a bit about some work that we did trying to change the culture within mental health services by actually providing staff with the exact same intervention that we provide the patients. Again, some, some media coverage. That was, this was in the UK. We've, we've had, done a lot of work with Brendan and also Fiona Gochran um, at, at King's College. But you 
here, here are the, the actual results. I'll just talk you through this. These are young people with early psychosis. Now, what you expect when people start antipsychotic medication is that within about three months, the average weight gain is between seven and eight kilograms. So that's considered normal. That's what we absolutely expect to happen. That's considered best practice care. An endocrinologist that we work with calls it standard neglect. She said that it's absolutely absurd that we expect patients to put on weight and we accept that that's going to happen. So what we aim to do with what we call the KBIM program, so keeping the body in mind, was we had a dietitian, an exercise physiologist, and a clinical nurse consultant embedded within the mental health service. And as soon as the patient came in, they saw the psychiatrist, they saw the psychologist, but they also got access to that KBIM team. And for 12 weeks, it was quite intensive. We, we, it was outreach as well. We would physically go and pick people up, bring them to the center, um, try to engage them as much as possible. We had sports groups, we had cooking groups where Scott Teasdale, our dietitian, um, would actually teach people how to, how to cook. We'd meet together in the community center, walk down to the shops as a, as a group. We'd actually budget together, teach them how to shop, and then come back and cook a meal together. Um, and what we did was we compared the results of that group versus a standard care group who didn't have access to the, the lifestyle intervention um, and just had access to treatment as usual. Um, and what was very clear, again, that standard weight gain, so treatment as usual, 7.8 kilograms, which is exactly what we'd expect. It's aligned with every single meta-analysis on this topic, between 7 and 8 kilograms. And in the KBIN group, we had a non-significant 1.8 kilogram increase. Um, and waist circumference, again, it's very, very clear. You can see seven centimeter increase in three months. And if you keep in mind, that's a faster increase in the rate of pregnancy. Um, so you can imagine these young people, how important it was to them. Um, and one of the things that we hear a lot, and I actually um, got in trouble with a, a chair of an ethics committee when I submitted an application about five or six years ago, <coughs> who rang me and said that the, and the application was to do some exercise work in psychosis, and she said, this is entirely unethical, you can't ask people with psychosis to exercise. Um, and we ended up having this, this massive argument, I had to bring a psychiatrist in to actually explain, no, it's, it's unethical not to be providing these interventions. These people are dying from premature heart disease, these interventions can help. But also the idea of acceptability. Um, Exercise is one of the most acceptable interventions we have for people living with mental illness, regardless of diagnosis. Um, I've lost my train of thought there. So the KBIM group, again, no, no change in waist circumference. Um, and it was on the back of these results that the district reinvested that million dollars and created three teams of these Keeping the Body in Mind teams across the district. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a little bit. This is probably one of my favourite studies published in, in recent times. It's very simple but very, very powerful. And this is Megan Edwards. She's at the University of Mississippi in the US. And very simple, what they did was took a group of young <coughs> college men. So they were exercise science students, so healthy, young, active exercise science students. Um, gave them all pedometers for, for one week and split them into two groups. The control group were told, do whatever you normally do for a one-week period. And of course, what happens when you give someone a pedometer? They, they do more. Not for very long, but they do a little bit more activity. And sure enough, the, the control group is the blue line. They did a little bit more activity, and this is depressive symptoms on this axis. And you can see their levels of depression just dropped ever so slightly over that week. Okay. The intervention group were given the pedometers, and they were told they were trying to induce a sedentary behavior intervention. So they said, right, keep your daily step count to under 5,000 steps and no structured exercise for one week. Um, I've got no idea how they got ethics approval for it, because there is not a chance in Australia they would let me do this. Um, but you can see very clearly what happened to their levels of depression. And again, these aren't people with diagnosable depression. These are just depressive symptoms among healthy, young, active men. And for me, this study is so powerful because if I think about the implications for mental health treatment, every facility I've ever worked at, the entire day is based around sitting. So patients spend their entire day sedentary, treatment is done sedentary, every activity is sedentary. And I think when we think about the idea about promoting physical activity, we need to think not just physical activity promotion, not just structured exercise, but actually how can we build systems and structures to reduce sedentary behaviour as part of mental health services. So when we look at the, the sedentary time of people living with, with mental illness, we know it's higher than the general population. So they're less likely to engage in exercise. They're far more sedentary, and we see it's higher in, in people with schizophrenia. And this was work published in, in World Psychiatry, again, by, by Brendan. So this was over, over 69 individual studies and over 35,000 participants showing the, the high levels of sedentary behaviour in people living with mental illness. We see the same thing in post-traumatic stress disorder, the same thing in substance use disorders as well. Now, you're probably asking, why do we have mental health staff here? And I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we've done in Australia to try and change the, the, the culture of mental health services. It was promising that their sedentary behaviour was, was a little bit less than the patients, but their physical health profile in many respects is just as bad. 
and we actually need to be starting with the staff before we can have any meaningful impact on patients. And there's a few reasons for that. And I quite like this cartoon. You know, I have shared my vision, so now we have a shared vision. And of course, it doesn't work that way. We actually need that bottom up. We need people on the ground. We need the clinicians working at the coal face to actually engage in these sorts of interventions. So when the district reinvested that million dollars and they said, right, you're going to roll this out across the district, we were a bit worried about just putting these exercise physiologists, dietitians, and nurses in these mental health facilities that hadn't gone through the same cultural change that had happened at Bondi, that sort of um, organic change in how people viewed these interventions. <coughs> so what we thought is we'll, we'll actually hold them back for a little bit and just try and start with the staff and see if we can get the staff moving, see if we can break down some of the resistance. Because some of the, the things we hear from you know, mental health nurses that have been in the system for 20 years is, you know, I'm a mental health professional, I'm not a personal trainer. If I wanted to be a personal trainer, I'd go and do my certificate. And so it's trying to change some of those views, and, and we were able to do that. And so what we did was we, we offered a four-week intervention that was paid for by the district during staff time. Um, which sounds a little bit ridiculous, particularly in the US, they just can't get their heads around how, you, how a district would fund interventions for their own staff. Um, but that's exactly what happened. And this was a, a biased sample of staff who agreed to participate. Um, so we ended up with, with 212 staff out of 700, um, we, but it was offered to the entire, entire mental health service. And what we found was that we weren't targeting, I should just stress that we weren't targeting weight loss among the staff. We didn't actually think that would happen within a four week intervention and a 16 week follow up. But we measured it anyways and we were really promising to see a reduction in waist circumference. And among staff that were overweight or obese, there was a 1.2 kilogram reduction in, in their body weight, which was really promising. Um, we looked at some qualitative stuff as well, and you can see my motivation increased. And participating in COSIM, which stands for keeping our staff in mind, um, was a positive experience. It got me setting goals, being more active, and eating better. And I'll, I'll tell you one example. We had this nurse who, who I mentioned before who was really negative about the whole thing, and we also gave staff pedometers. Um, but he just you know, wasn't really interested initially. And after a couple of weeks, he came to us and just said, oh, do you, do you mind if I just have a pedometer as well? I'm just interested to see what it looks like. And of course, he wasn't counted as part of the study, but we said, sure, and we gave him a pedometer. And about two weeks after that, he was coming in and, and showing the dietitian what he'd cooked for lunch. Um, and so there was a huge change in his behavior that we haven't captured in any of this data, but that actually has a huge impact on then how he treats his patients and what he's actually recommending to his patients. Um, and so really, we can't emphasize enough how important it is actually working with the culture of the services to try and change those services to embed these sorts of interventions. Sedentary behaviour, we reduced it by over an hour among the staff. This is self-reported sedentary behaviour. Um, and again, the staff reported things like insight into sedentary behaviour, daily activity, dietary consumption as well. Um, and 95% said so they plan to pay more attention to increasing physical activity. What we also saw happen at the different sites was things like walking groups come up where the, the staff organised them and actually brought patients along together. Um, that wasn't planned, it wasn't something we pushed, but that just happened organically again. Um, what was most promising for me was at baseline 10% had seen a dietitian and 7% and had said they had seen an exercise physiologist or knew what an exercise physiologist did. Um, with the dietitians, they thought that they just told you to eat peas and carrots. That's what a lot of the, the mental health nurses told us, what their understanding of dietitians were. And of course, it's, it, it's much more than that. Um, and so to have it follow up 95 and 93% reporting a better understanding and also having been through the exact same assessments and exact same intervention that the patients are going to go through, they're far more able to to push it, refer it, um, and actually endorse it as well. So this, this idea of changing culture is, is, is hugely important, and this is a bit of a funny experience. Um, this photo was taken at the Australian Psychiatry Conference. Um, so you can imagine the drug area had all the, the pharmaceutical companies handing out coffee and pens, um, and then Exercise Sports Science Australia had two Monarch bikes doing, trying to do fitness testing on the delegates during the lunch break. Um, so they initially gave us a, a pretty wide berth until some of the consultants who really believe in this actually made all their registrars come over and, and actually sit on the bike. Um, but what we did was, that's, that's Hamish Fibbins, who's one of my PhD students in the middle. We actually collected that data and we published a paper subsequently looking at the relationship between psychiatrists' own fitness levels, their own physical activity levels, and their willingness and interest in referring their patients. Um, what was slightly surprising was that these were people that were willing to come and have their fitness tested in front of all their colleagues at a psychiatry conference and 65% were still inactive, which is the exact same figure we see in the Australian general population. So again, this idea that if we're going to try and change patients' behaviour, we really need to start with where one of the problems is, and that's with the, the staff themselves. So this idea of um, pr promoting the role of physical activity as an integrated routine part of practice, this was a, a little piece of work between four organisations from the UK, Australia, um, and, and New Zealand and the US. 
where we came up with this target, and sorry, the font's gone a bit weird there, um, of working towards a 50% reduction in life expectancy in this group by 2032, and that's an Olympic year. Now, of course, this is actually completely ridiculous, and if we really wanted to achieve this, the number one thing we would do is actually look at smoking. A third of all cigarettes are smoked by people living with a mental illness. That is the number one risk factor that we could address instantly. And there's a lot of good programs coming out around smoking reduction in this group. Um, but really what this reflects is, again, the idea that this isn't a gap in our knowledge. We know how to address this issue. We're just not resourcing it appropriately. And the three things that we came up with as, uh, as factors that we need to be looking at is knowledge, infrastructure, and culture. And I've talked a lot about culture within mental health services. But one of the key things is knowledge. And what we're talking about there is not just knowledge of, of physical therapists, exercise scientists, in mental health and psychopathology, but also the other way around. We need medical students, we need psychiatry registrars, we need psychiatrists being trained in the role of physical activity, the role of diet interventions, and how they can actually work together. Um, and I think increasingly we're seeing that happen, but there's still a, a huge gap. Um, and and the, the ability and the options for these groups to actually work together is, is enormous. Um, infrastructure, that's a no-brainer. We need some level of infrastructure. We have a lot of EPs working in, in mental health facilities where they only have access to, to elastic bands. That's fine initially. Um, there's you know, certain things we can do with that, but we need some level of investment from, from mental health services as well. <laughs> now, these are slides that are not going to be relevant to this audience, but they're stuff that I stress with the psychiatrist, so I thought I would just leave it in anyways. And one of the big issues we have is when the psychiatrists think about exercise, typically they think weight loss. That's the only thing they link it to. Um, and we know the data on exercise and weight loss and how in the absence of dietary change we're actually setting people up to fail. Um, this is something we wrote about in the conversation, talking about just changing the measure of success of exercise interventions. And I'll, I'll talk through some data here. This is not people with mental illness. This is general population data in the US. One in 210 obese men and one in 124 obese women will achieve a normal weight without surgery. Um, and most will put that back on within, within two years. At least half will regain it within two years. Now, the reason this is so damaging is if we look at why people want to exercise, and particularly people with mental illness, but it's the same in the general population, the number one reason they talk about is weight loss. Now, if we're, we're not addressing people's diet and, and people are on things like antipsychotic medication that make weight loss really difficult, we've really got to shift this conversation away from weight loss. Um, in many of the clinics that we run back home, we actually don't measure weight because it's just not a good outcome. Um, and I'm sure people here have experienced the same thing where you work with people, they're extremely motivated, they go away for a couple of weeks or a month, they come back and they're telling you about all the exercise they've been doing and how excited they are, they hop on the scale, it's gone up. Um, and how demotivating that is for someone, um, particularly this, this population. Um, so one of the, the key things we want to try and shift away from is the idea about all the other benefits that people can get from exercise. So, so the mood benefits, how do people feel? Are they getting out of bed? Do they feel better engaging with their friends? Are they sleeping better? All those other benefits that, that we see. And again, this is not news here, but the, the importance of fitness as a, as a predictor of, of morbidity and mortality. And we know that as little as three and a half mils were associated with significant reductions in mortality. And even more recently, this just came out um, a couple of weeks ago. This is data from the US, 120,000 people followed up over, I think, a mean of seven years, but effectively showing the fitter you are, the longer you live. So if we talk about this gap in life expectancy facing people with mental illness, and then we see this data, and what I think is, is, is most striking about this is if we think about people living with mental illness, they're typically here. And actually where the biggest jump is and the biggest public health benefits are getting people that are low at the bottom of the fitness level to somewhat better. And it supports the evidence around mood as well, where we know that for people that are completely inactive, doing something is better than nothing. Um, and it's really as simple as that. If you're doing something, try for a little bit more. Um, but where we stand to get the biggest bang for our buck, not only on physical health, but also on mental health, is investing in the people here that are doing absolutely nothing, completely sedentary, completely disengaged, getting them to do something. Um, so we asked the question a couple of years ago, again, led by, by Brendan and, and our colleague Davy Van Campford in Belgium, can exercise improve fitness in people living with depression and schizophrenia? And it seems like a little bit of a, a ridiculous question to ask. Um, but of course you absolutely can, just the same as the general population. People can engage in these programs, they can um, get better and they can actually get really positive outcomes. So I'm going to change tack a little bit to talk a little bit about a topic that I'm really passionate about, which is resistance training. Um, and this, for me, came about from my time in the, in the inpatient unit, where, again, I would go to patients' rooms, mainly with, with PTSD. And when I first started, they would literally just tell me to, to F off out of the room. They weren't interested. So I realized very quickly that going in and saying, hey, do you want to go for a walk or go for a run, just wasn't going to work. 
So what I tried was going in with some elastic bands or some resistance training equipment, which did take a bit of time to get through risk assessment. I had to, to physically demonstrate to the risk assessor that I couldn't strangle myself with these elastic bands. Um, but going in with those bands saying, right, we're going to do 10 bicep curls and I'm going to leave you alone. And they would often do it just so that I would leave them alone, but then the next day you could come back and you could do two sets of 10. And then a few days later you could come back and say, right, before we do that, we're just going to walk to the nurse's station and back. And then you've just got them out of bed. And then you gradually build the program from there. And for me, that was hugely effective. And so that's where my, my interest in strength training came from. And the references are cut off, but there's two recent meta-analyses, one in sports medicine on resistance training and anxiety, um, and one in JAMA psychiatry on resistance training and depression um, by Matt Herring and, and Brett Gordon's group. So this was the, the gym that I had access to at the hospital when they sort of handed me that duress alarm. And it was, it was atrocious. It was locked up for about six years. So you can imagine that carpet, how that smelt. Um, and also we had this old cable machine, but it was completely broken. So the only thing we could actually do with it was wrap the elastic bands around it. Um, we had a Smith machine, but no free weights because the hospital had decided they were dangerous. We weren't allowed to have them. Um, of course, that's completely changed now, and this is really exciting. This is John Bale, who was the CEO of a charity, a veterans charity called Soldier On, um, and they managed to raise about 20,000 Australian dollars um, and in order to, to, to refurb that gym. So I'll talk you through the, the results of that trial. So what we did was it was a randomised control trial looking at the impact of adding exercise to usual care for inpatients with, with severe PTSD. So again, they were... Um, Mainly, we had veterans, we had police officers, uh, paramedics, and, and fireys as well. Um, so we added exercise to usual care. It was a 12-week intervention. It was very cheap. Um, it was just my time, which was extremely cheap. Um, and we were just looking at trying to encourage general physical activity. We used a combination of resistance training with the bands, but also a pedometer. The, the grounds of the hospital, it's called St John of God Hospital, is in a beautiful location at the foothills of the Blue Mountains in Sydney. So we tried to encourage people to do a lot of walking. Um, for example, we, they had to walk to the dining room three times a day in order to get their meals. So we just built a little track around where they could get an extra 500 steps every time they went to the dining room. And that added for some people about 30 to 50% of their daily step count. Um, we kept diaries, we wrote that all down. So all the basic things that we'd use as part of a, a physical activity program, it was nothing fancy at all. It was just applying that to this population that hadn't been done. Um, and this scale here is the, the PCL, which is a self-report measure of, of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Um, the scale goes from 17 to 85. Um, diagnostic cutoff is about 40 to 45. So you can see at baseline, both groups were, were 65, which reflects the fact these are really severely unwell, severely affected inpatients. Um, and what we're looking for on this scale is a change of somewhere between five and 10 points. Um, that indicates clinical significant change. The control group, the red line, they had a four point change. They're getting best practice usual care, so keep that in mind. This is absolutely gold standard PTSD treatment. Um, and we had just under a five point reduction. When we added exercise, we had just under a 10 point reduction in symptoms. Um, and the between group difference was, was statistically and clinically significant as well at five points. So again, a very simple intervention that we were able to use. When we looked at the depression, anxiety and stress, and we know that depressive symptoms are highly comorbid among all mental illness. Um, this is again something coming back to Joe's comment about the biceps don't care what diagnosis you have. And you can see the effect size here. We don't need to be a statistician to, to see the between group effects there and how highly significant this was. Um, and also is in line with the literature around exercise and depression. Um, now, anthropometry, this is really exciting because we actually had no dietary intervention. I wasn't expecting any change in weight. And what's most worrying is, is if you look at the control group, it's actually on the up. And we see that time and time again in inpatient facilities. They come in, they're getting three cooked meals a day. The lovely people serving food think they're doing the right thing by giving an extra serve of ice cream and pudding and bacon and whatever else they're serving. And people actually do gain weight. Um, that's absolutely standard. We know the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in PTSD is around 40%. There's a twice increased risk. These conditions are highly comorbid, the, the poor physical health of people living with, with mental illness and waist circumference as well. So so even without a dietary intervention, we were able to not only get it heading in the right direction, but sort of prevent it from going up, which was, which was really promising. And the next step now we're looking at is, is combining dietary interventions, also smoking, also sleep as well. Um, one of the criticisms is, well, maybe it's just extra time and attention. Maybe that, that was driving it. And if we look at self-reported physical activity, you can see clearly there was a reduction in sitting, sitting time. So the, in, the control group was sitting about an hour and a half extra per day, whereas the intervention group reduced their sitting time by 150 minutes. Um, and you can see time spent walking um, dramatically increased for the, for the exercise group as well, which was, which was really promising and provides evidence for the fact that this is a, is a real effect of the actual exercise as opposed to, to, to something else going on.
So this idea of resistance training has taken me to some, some pretty interesting places. And recently I was in um, Turkey on the, on the Syrian border working with Syrian psychosocial workers, um, using strength training as a, as a tool to try and help improve, re reduce stress, reduce anxiety. Um, so this was a, an interesting experience, but effectively what we did was we, using these therabands, developed a bit of a workshop. This is Ruth Wells, a psychologist, um, did a PhD with Syrian refugees in Jordan. Um, and again, the benefits here that they reported is the exact same as what we see in high income settings. Um, it's really the, the, these benefits of physical activity in terms of the mental health benefits. It doesn't matter where you are, what conditions you're living in. It's the exact same outcome. And we're working at the moment. There's a lot of trouble working with, with Syrians. <coughs> whether they're in Turkey or still in Syria, um, but at the moment we're using social media. So we're using Facebook um, to actually try and provide a physical activity intervention for, for, for refugees or people living there at the moment in displacement. And more recently, <coughs> excuse me, um, this idea about physical activity and trauma has, has taken me to Bangladesh, where I'm doing most of my work at the moment. Um, and Bangladesh at the moment, this is the world's biggest refugee camp that's home to just under one million people. There's about 900,000 um, Rohingya refugees that have come from Burma living in, and this is Kudupalong camp, um, which is a, a pretty um, <coughs> incredible thing to see. You, you know, you're standing up on the hill, and as far as your eyes can see, all you can see is this sort of temporary accommodation and also the monsoon rolling in as well. Um, we were back there in, in January, and this video might play as well. Um, again, that's the extension camp. We were back there in, in, in January doing a, a community readiness assessment where we, we interviewed members of the Rohingya community to try and get an idea about their views on not only mental health and, and mental illness, but also on, on physical activity. And a couple of things really stood out to me, and you can see this photo, this was taken at a soccer game that they, they put on for us between the registered and unregistered refugees, that's how they separate themselves. Um, which, which was quite amazing, and again, the, the camaraderie and support around that. Um, but the, the idea about sport, you can see these shadows behind me. Um, it really has a huge effect on the community, not just the players. Um, the, the social building, the peace building, um, the increase in, in, in purpose. One of the, the things that they told us was that sport was one of the only things they had control over. So the refugees there have no human rights. They're not recognized as people. They're, they're completely stateless but yet no one can take their sport away from them. And it's one of the only things that they use, that they turn to, that they acknowledge as actually having an impact on, on their mental health. And so we came up with, with a program, and one of the words that they kept telling us, which was really interesting, when they talked about the benefits of sport, they would say mind fresh, which, which I really liked as a term. Um, the other word that they used was, was tension. That's their, their word for, for, for psychosocial distress, for mental illness. It's kind of this all-encompassing term. And what they would tell us was that when they're playing sport, they would feel tensionless, tensionless and mind fresh. So we went away and developed this program that we're, we're calling mind fresh. And, and the next step, I'm going back in, in a week, is to work with the International Organization for Migration to actually try and establish sports therapists um, within the camp. So we want to try and provide employment to local Rohingya, but actually train them, give them the resources that they can provide sport, um, not only just to the people that are physically able and that can compete at that high level, but actually reach out to the other people within the community that wouldn't have the means to engage. Um, so really the, the most vulnerable, and particularly children. And one of the, the, the basis for this and the justification is the idea of prevention. Um, this is an extremely traumatized, population and if we can actually keep kids active potentially we might be able to prevent some of those cases of, of severe trauma going forward. So I'm going to finish up in a couple of minutes. There's just a few resources that I just kind of wanted to point out and a lot of this stuff you're probably well across and particularly the one on the left which has actually come from the NHS. But this idea of NPJ paralysis which I'm sure most people have heard of and this is getting a lot of traction in Australia. We've kind of stolen it from you guys. Um, but it's the idea about getting patients out of bed. Um, because we know the, the negative impact of, of bed rest. This isn't being applied within psychiatric hospitals. Um, we're not sure why, because it, again, it's a great message. The exact same thing could be used. Um, so we're trying to do that at the moment. And there's also a lot of online, uh, massive open online courses happening around physical activity promotion, particularly in low middle income countries. So trying to give um, health workers the, the skills and resources and confidence to actually engage uh, and provide these sorts of interventions. I just want to give a, a shout out to, to Brendan here as well. So this was a, a textbook that came out uh, last year that Brendan and I co-edited. And, and really, I, I need to acknowledge Brendan's name is, is absolutely synonymous with this field. And I know that he's going to be speaking at the end of the day. Um, but the, it was really exciting for us to see this book come out. And in Australia, I know it's now being used as text for within physiotherapy and with also within the exercise physiology programs, um, which provides an outline and, again, hopefully bridges that gap with, with, with the training needs for these future clinicians.
All right, the last thing I'm going to talk about is a, is a physical activity questionnaire that we developed uh, specifically for people living with mental illness. And, and the idea behind this was the fact that given the overwhelming evidence we have around exercise, why don't doctors ask about it? Similar to the vital sign argument that, that Bob Salas had in the US with the idea about measuring physical activity just like a vital sign. And one of the issues we had was that existing self, we know the limitations of self-report physical activity measures, they're completely useless. The, the acceptable correlation coefficient with an objective monitor is 0.3, which is about 9% shared variance. So that's what we consider acceptable, so we know there's, there's problems with self-report. But until we have enough money and, and cheap technology to actually objectively assess physical activity within mental health settings, which I think we're still a long, long way off, we have to rely on self-report. So the, some of the limitations with existing tools was that for people with cognitive impairments and people living with, with mental illness, they were just really difficult for people to, to respond to. Um, and so in 2014, we sort of formed an international working group with the idea of trying to develop a new tool that would be appropriate for this population, would take those unique barriers into account. Um, and we came up with a simple physical activity questionnaire and the idea is, is that it is an interview. It's designed to be used by either an exercise professional or a psychiatrist <coughs> or mental health professional. It can be done in as little as three to seven minutes. Um, partly as a screening tool, but partly also to form the basis of an intervention. So back home, we would take um, an initial assessment, maybe 20 minutes to go through this to get a really detailed uh, physical activity history. Um, but the psychiatrist and the mental health professionals can do it much quicker. And we then proceeded to validate this in 1,000 patients from 23 countries, which was an absolute nightmare, um, including 30% from low middle income countries like Pakistan and Nigeria. And you can imagine the issues about measuring physical activity there, trying to, to have something that was appropriate across all those settings was, was close to impossible. Um, there's some of the countries, but we have finished that now. And we do have the data. It's, it's freely available online. Um, and what we found is that overall, there's, there's acceptable test, retest, reliability, um, and the correlation coefficients with the objective monitor is exactly what we would have expected at around 0.3. Um, so that should be published very, very soon. But again, it's available freely um, on the internet at simpac.org. Um, but I'm happy to provide anyone with details about that afterwards. My second last slide, I use this a lot for me. I think when we think about the, the potential of these interventions and the silos of healthcare, we've got the physical healthcare, we've got mental healthcare. I think where exercise, diet, um, lifestyle interventions sit actually bridging this gap is a, is a really exciting place to be and I think the, the field is sort of exploding and again conferences like this are, are super exciting to see where, where this will be in another five years. So thanks for, for having me.